Turn with me, if you would, to the 14th chapter of Luke. The is actually part of the bulletin. For the Gospel lesson, chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. A great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these words are challenging words. Sometimes we would rather avoid the confrontation that these words represent. Why should we hate our family? Why should we hate other people that are not even in our family? Lord, help us to understand your word so that we can live out the word that you've given us in our lives in a way that will be a blessing to others and a blessing to one another. In your name we pray. Amen. There's a very interesting word here that needs to be focused on for a moment, and that is hate. The way hate was actually used in the Bible is loveless. It isn't an act of hate in the sense that you do something to spite that person. But it's actually to love Christ more than anyone else and to love others more than we love ourselves. So that hate then, in the correct context, has the sense about it of actually establishing priorities for us. And so when we read now great crowds accompanying him, and if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, in other words, if anyone comes to me and does not put me ahead of my father and mother, or we put it, our wives and fathers and mothers ahead of our Christ, then we're doing a great disservice to God's word. Then it goes on to say, whoever does not bear his own cross. Now when I read this, I got stuck on the word. Because you see, the Bible tells us that we must bear our own cross. We have a tendency in our own lives to actually wear the cross. How many of you have a cross that you wear either around a chain or as couplings? Or I've seen it in all sorts of different ways. Probably most of you in one way or another have seen a cross as, as uh, jewelry that is used in order to make a statement. But you see, the scripture does not really care whether we wear our cross. The scripture cares whether we bear our cross, whether we actually carry the cross, and that doesn't mean our mother-in-law. It doesn't mean anyone like that, that we can't stand. What it means is that we bear the cross that Christ has placed in front of us as the cross that we must carry in order to further his kingdom, not our own. And so I would challenge you, don't give up the jewelry, but let the jewelry remind you as to what the cross really signifies. When we sing the tie the cross, what we're saying is that the cross is ahead of everything else that we do. We always look at the cross and what happened there in order to understand our own lives. And so the first thing that we have in this text is we have the challenge for us to bear the cross. Let me read it to you again. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So it isn't enough to wear it. It's important for you to recognize that Jesus calls us to bear the cross for him. Now, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cross? The first element of really grappling with the cross in our lives is to recognize that we have been called as disciples. But this is not just some easy task. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to make Christianity and sugarcoat it, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. Christianity is not a message which, which can be sugarcoated. If you are challenging yourselves, and if you aren't being challenged by the Word of God, then you probably are missing a very important part of the Gospel. 
And that is that the gospel challenges you with different priorities. Remember how we talked last week about the Bible is always challenging us to have a different perspective than the world has? We quoted Romans 12, where Paul writes to the, the uh, various people in Rome and says to them, look, it's important for you to recognize that you should not allow yourself to be molded by the word, by the world but rather be shaped by the gospel. And that's what we're talking about. If we're really allowing the word of God to hit us in the face and to get us in the stomach, so to speak, then we're missing something. Because if you're going to be a follower, you better come to cause what it would mean for you and your job and your life. Will somebody look at you and say, come on, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Let's go out and uh, do the crowd. It's not such a far fetched thought that some people have. And, well, I won't go into that. I was going to be confessing here, but I didn't have to confess too much. But count the cross. First of all, recognize to bear the cross, but then to count the cross. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying to his disciples, count the cross. Look, if somebody's going to build a tower, if you're going to have a building project, you better have a way to figure out a way to, copy, to, to meet the costs that are going to be incurred in advancing that particular project. And so this second example with the king, what happens with the king? The king sits down and says to himself, wow, I only have 10,000 troops. The enemy that's coming towards me has 20,000 troops. Am I going to be able to succeed and win this battle? And if I can't really imagine myself, even though I paid the cost of my 10,000 soldiers, to imagine myself victorious, then I'd have to think twice and maybe make some offering of peace that will allow us to continue. So the third thing that we then come to after counting the cross, first bear the cross, count the cross, the fourth thing, the third thing, is renounce all that he has. Anyone who's not willing to renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, when I come to that text, I say to myself, I know that's the gospel lesson, but I think I can find a gospel lesson that's a little easier on us. And I want to avoid it. To renounce all that we have. To renounce all that we have. Are we really willing to do? Or is it something that we need to do again and again and again? Every day asking the Holy Spirit to enter our lives in order to make it possible for us to renounce the very things that we think will bring salvation when they don't. Be a B.J. Thompson, not the singer, but a Christian writer and Christian speaker, put it this way. Unless Jesus Christ is enough. Unless Jesus Christ is enough, nothing else will be. Let that say again. Unless our Lord and Savior is enough for you, where you no longer have any additional wants, you say to yourself, Lord, if I can have you and if you can be within me and send your spirit into me, if, if I'm able to pray that prayer, unless Jesus is enough, all of the other things that we might try in order to make our life happier and better and more significant will be of no naught. Why? Because nothing is enough if Jesus is enough. And I challenge us to think through our lives. Where is it that Jesus is? You've heard me say before in the business of John Piper, who says that if that God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. Are you looking for something else other than Jesus? Are you looking for something, a better house or a better home or more information or whatever it might be, a higher job position? People don't recognize my talents. And therefore, I'm going to get upset at them. Are you interested in having more and more and more? The problem is that none of them satisfy unless we go to Jesus first and have him be first in our lives. Or as Jesus
Jesus says it here, renounce all that he has, cannot be my disciple. And then it seems to me, out of nowhere, Jesus seems to turn to another passage, which continues, a continuing passage here, and says, salt is good, but salt has lost its, its uh, taste. How shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying here? And how does that fit in with discipleship? Well, Jesus is telling us that in so many words that when you are a disciple, there is always the possibility and there is always the risk that you're going to take that you're going to lose your saltiness. Just as salt is no good in certain circumstances, it isn't even good for the manure pile, that can happen to us as Christians. It can happen to us as Christians who want to follow, but then one thing after another leads us away to seek our joy and happiness and fulfillment someplace else. And Jesus is saying, just as that happens to salt, so that can happen to you and to me. You see, salt was very important in those days. In fact, soldiers were often paid by salt. A pound of salt, which was a tremendous gift, whatever a person was doing. But they also recognized that the two main functions of salt need to be incorporated into our congregation here at St. Paul. The first thing about salt is that it enhances the taste. We should be a kind of congregation, and I think we really are. And there are so many of us who are examples of that. We should be the kind of congregation that will increase the taste, make the world, make people look at us as they encounter us and say to themselves, wow, oh, they are really <coughs> wonderful people. Look at the way they give, look at the way they live with one another, look at the song of them. So that's the first task of science, to make us a congregation that enjoys expressing the love of God amongst ourselves and amongst others. The second purpose for salt is preservation. They used salt in order to maintain the meat, which had, they did have no uh, uh, ice box, no refrigerators. They, they had sort of ice and straw that they would use. Most of the time, they actually had to use salt in order to preserve their meat and other food. And Jesus is saying, that's it. Who should be a preserver? You should make God's gospel message so central to your life that everyone will recognize, wow, that person is a follower of Christ. I don't mean somebody who just shows off. I don't mean somebody who tries to uh, make himself or herself look good. I'm thinking about somebody who needs to be preserved, who needs to hear the message of God. See, saltiness is a quality cannot be gained by having sugar-coated messages. If I sugar-coat my message, that does not make for salty Christians. If I say to myself, oh, we want to appeal to more people because we want to have them look at us and say, wow, those are really good people. No. You see, it's important for us to recognize that as a preservative, salt is necessary. But saltiness cannot be attained, obtained through a sugar-coated message. But you know, in modern day, we have another problem. The other problem that we have is that we really don't recognize the salt all that much. Anymore. In fact, I have this uh, salt alternative. See, the question that I want to raise is perhaps we value salt. But many of us are caught up in the desire to have a salt alternative. In other words, to go to other way, to enter into relationships with other people in a way that doesn't require us to have salt at all because we have a substitute. It's another way of saying that we have idols. What's your idol? Your family? Your farm? Your friends? The money that you have in the bank? 
What's your idol? The friendships that you have made? You could have all sorts of idols. And now that all those idols are salt substitutes. They just work for a moment and then they're no good anymore. So I challenge us. Let us bear our cross. Let us cost out to decide whether let us establish and recognize the cost of being a disciple. Help us to renounce ourselves and to put Christ first. And finally, let us be salty again. I've never been abused this, but as it, except as an example. What example can you use for you have recently? Put aside Jesus and picked up a substance.